this place has been open since 1988 and people just will give their pictures or they've been taking pictures right here at homeboy and uh yeah this is so many stories of so many lives stories of of, of redemption and sometimes it's monetarily and sometimes just with families and, and love surrounded by love My childhood was, I would say, a little different. My twin brother and I, we, we went through the system together into a family that was a little chaotic, you know? Father just died from a heroin overdose a week before we were born. Mom was a heroin addict until an adult, as a, it turned into an adult. I was about 25 when she started cleaning up. Thank God she's clean now. So the story of being in the projects, aunts and uncles, Drugs, gangs, ODs in the house, death, and um, and a child trying to navigate their way through violence and domestic violence and the violence that domestic violence how it spilled over to you know we got a piece of that violence too you know yeah and uh, and you know just thinking about a child going through these types of things. I think of a little puppy, like let's just say a pit bull, and you grab it by the face and twirl it around, eventually it starts to bite and bark back, and and then you start to live that life of, of biting and barking, because you don't want to be, I don't like no one touching my face no more. There was kind of no real adult to take care of us. We have older homies and who are just as lost, but they're older. So it's like the blind leading the blind, getting us ready for juvenile hall getting us ready for prison, lacing us up on how to make money and how to be. And how to be is, is not the normal life. Well, I was growing up and you go from, from elementary to, uh, to junior high school, I, there was something that really popped out to me. And it was, um, it was the excitement of, going to the big school, getting out of elementary, and um, and like, I'm gonna make new friends. You know, when you're from the projects, like pretty much everybody's your friend. You know, you, you, your generation's there and you know everybody. So, you know, looking back, I took it for granted, like of how to make friends. I didn't, socially, I didn't know how to make friends. I thought everybody was your friend. And I know that's it young ignorant but i was young and <laughs> so i i remember going to to uh junior high school thinking now i make new friends you know hormones are happening so i like girls now and um i went and i, I seen some dudes that i said these guys look like they're players you know they look like you know they could get girls and i'm gonna hang out with these guys a little bit older dudes you know yeah. and um i just went and and, and um I hung out with them for a couple of days, you know, like one day. And then the second day, you know, the dude said like, hey dude, why are you here with us? He told me this. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm kicking it dog. Like, I know, I, you know I mean? I'm gonna kick it with you guys, you know? Yeah. And then the guy said like, you can't kick it with us, man. You're a scrub, you're a seventh grader. I mean, from the projects. And I was like, what? Like, I've never heard that before. I've never been disliked that before. And it and it it hit my heart, you know, to be pushed aside. Yeah. And I was like, I, I I'm sure I said something, but what was more powerful was the rejection. And and I remember thinking, like, man, forget you then, you know. And I I turned around and walked away. And uh and then I went toward the projects, you know, where the projects kick it at. And then one of my homies seen me. He didn't know what just happened, but he looked at me and he's like, like guy got fooled. You remember him just going like that, and something in my in my head said, "Don't ever leave y your people. Like nobody wants us, you know." And and it's a significant time for a person of, the, of that age about identity and stuff. And and it just took that moment to really put it, put the nail in to say, "I'm from the projects. Everybody else don't like us. We're not we're not like them." So. Yeah. You know, and I remember that day walking back from um, from school back to the projects. I told three of my homeboys, "Jump me in RG right now." 
And they said, let's just wait till we get to the projects. I said, no, no, no. I'm walking in an RG boy, like Ramona Gardens boy. It's a, it's a little step before you get into the, to the gang. And, uh, and I got jumped in. You know, even though I was born and raised, like now we went through the, through the fire, the ceremony of getting in. And then the other side, I would say, I lost hope completely. And so if you lose hope, you join a gang. Well, what are the benefits of being from this neighborhood, you know? PCP was huge. You start selling PCP, start dealing with your homeboys on, on, you know, the older homies, how they can embrace you and they can still steal from you. So you learn those lessons. Um, you, 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 you fight, you know, you, sometimes you fight without even doing anything wrong. You just fight because the older homie wants to, you know, get you, get you ready. You remember the dog? Yes, yes. You know, he wants to test you. He wants to make sure that you're gonna go to juvenile hall and you're gonna fight in juvenile hall. So it doesn't matter how big they are, you know? So you get that test every once in a warrior while. Warrior mentality, right? Yeah, it's that warrior mentality, I guess. You know, if we want to romanticize it, then yeah. Yeah. It would be that. And um, and then you're still in cars. You want to learn how to drive. You know, there's no father. No, no one's trying to teach you how to drive. We just got to learn on our own. So you learn how to use a dent puller. You learn how to use that flathead screwdriver. Um, and you learn how to drive. Speaking of stealing cars, <laughs> there was a time when, um, you know, we're right by USC Medical. Uh, so we by Hazard Park. I remember I went over there and, and carjacked some dude, you know, so put a gun on him and give me the car keys. And, and uh, let me get my paperwork. I remember him saying that. I said, sure, you know, took his paperwork. And um, I jumped in his car because he ran. I said, this was gonna call the cops. I jumped in his car and that fool had a stick. It was stick, I don't know how to drive stick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I managed to get it off that street and then I had to cross Soto Street to go over the hill and just kind of guide, you know, just put it in neutral and guide it down into the project. And I was I was gonna cross Soto Street. There was a red light, and then and then next thing you know, I would turn green and I go, er, 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 you know, going over Soto Street, and the cop was right there, just looking at me like, "What are you doing, stupid?" Now I'm like, "Oh no," you know. Yeah. So he he just flicked his little light on and caught me, and I was surrounded by cops in in a minute and got my butt kicked and um, and then everything, all the teachings of get ready because in juvenile hall, this is gonna happen. You need to be ready. Definitely kicked in. First day, Central Juvenile Hall, Unit R. Hey, I said, where you from? And then everyone just turns their head to you. How are you gonna answer this? And you already know how you're gonna answer it. You yell out your neighborhood, somebody stomps, you take flight. And I don't know if you guys were in, in Central Juvenile Hall in the in the eighties, but some of the biggest biggest dudes were in Unit R and just laughing at little Mexicans, just picking them up, slapping them against the walls. You know what I mean? And it was a game for them, you know. And it was just a, a reality for us of you know, just a bulldog, just keep on going until they tear you off, you know. During those testing periods, um, and they, I remember them telling me straight up, like, you're going to juvenile hall. This is what you're gonna have to deal with. And you cannot be afraid. As a child, um, you know, looking to do his best in something that I feel embraced in, you, you take that serious. And, and you know that the odds are gonna be against you. And, but you still have to go in full force. You might not even know how to fight, but as long as you're swinging those these dogs, you know, you you feel like, well, I did my part. I did what I was supposed to do. Even staff kind of saying like, you did good. I remember that. And, I, and then I remember thinking I did do good. Yeah. And as much as I would rather had been on a baseball team or a football team and had a father to say, good job, son. Yeah. I didn't have that, I had this. Been jumped. Uh, I've been shot at many, many times. I remember axes coming by my face. 
I remember the old school black jackets with the line all the way around, those bomber jackets. Oh yeah, yeah. So I had that on, and I got hit with the with the axe on my on the side of my jacket, and it tore everything. The jacket, my shirt, and my skin was not torn, and I felt like that was a miracle from God. There's no way my skin is even more tender than the shirt that I was wearing. And I had a gun pulled out of me. And then my homeboy was saying, pull the trigger. And I was just looking at him like, you know, like, how are you gonna tell me about to pull the trigger? He's right, his gun is on us, but he didn't. Yeah. And we ran. And that same ax hit my other homeboy in the head and he had major stitches. He was bleeding like a, like a crazy man. Um, the poles that, that were being swung on us broke my other homeboy's arms. And, and I kind of looked like, how come I didn't get hurt like yeah. these guys did? It's yeah. a miracle to me. There's one thing that, that saved me all the time, and it was God. And then one day my mom, you know, she said, look, look son, I know you guys were gonna be street guys. And she goes, and I couldn't take care of you. She goes, I'd be nodding out on heroin. She, and she says, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I'll be nodding and I'll be praying hard as I could to God saying, I can't take care of these boys, they're your sons. And, and I feel like when she told me that, I was like, wow, you know. She said, you take care of them, because I can't. That's why I'm alive. That's why I made it. Because there's, there's no way that somebody could walk barefooted through glass and not get cut. We made it through. My twin brother got shot in the head, bullets, fragments in his brain, and he rides a motorcycle today. Just a certain time before I came here, I was just lost. Just lost. The baby's mom was gone. Um, I wasn't drug dealing no more. I chose not to do that anymore. I just, I just beat, you know, some serious, serious charges. I, the smart thing to do is not to put myself back in that situation again. I remember just uh, saying like, where do I go from here? I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And one of my friends from Oxnard, I'm from Boyle Heights. The homeboy started in Boyle Heights. I've known Father Greg since juvenile hall. I met him in juvenile hall. And he told me, why don't you go to Homeboy Industries? And I was like, what? Like, how do you know about Homeboy Industries? And he said like, Father Greg will, you know, get you anything you want, anything you need to make you successful or a better person. I was looking for signs, actually, like anything. And when that one rang to me, and I said, I'm, done, I'm gonna do that. So I came down to Homeboy Industries since we were on First Street. And it happened to be that Father Greg was there because I find out he's hardy there. And it happened to be not a long line because I wouldn't have waited. Just again, to me is divine. It's just like intervention, just God's opened the doors and I feel like I came in and what's up, Father Greg? I don't know if you remember me, but one of the two, one of the twins from Rowana Gardens, you know? And and oh son, welcome. He gave me a big hug and and um he just kind of talked a little bit about my life and where I've been and and how how could he help me. And I thought he was gonna put me in college or something like that. And and he said, Why don't you work here? And I go like, nah, no, I got I mean, I'm not a gangbanger no more, you know? And he goes, no, nah, man, God wants you to work here. Ding, there's that little, there's that thing. So I said, I'm in, okay. What are we, you know, what, what are you gonna pay me, Father Greg? Eight dollars an hour, son. I was, like, <laughs> like, I was like, kid money, you know? And, and he goes, you know, I remember Father Greg like proud, like higher than minimum wage. And I was just like, oh no, like, and, but but I, again, I felt like God was with me. He just said like, don't worry. If I could feed, you know, crowds of thousands with, you know, a couple loaves of bread and a couple of fish, I got you. Yeah. And I said, okay. I just said, okay. And he was not lying. I was taken care of. I had food, I had shelter, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't in abundance. It was enough. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how it started. And then when, when I came in here, like I looked around and 
and I said, put your head to the ground and, and get in it. Like, you know, cause it, you know, people come in raw and this and that. And sometimes I hear like, where are you from? Like, shut up. You know, go gang bang outside if you want to do that. I came here to take care of me. Yeah. And, and so I did. And, and then I started to pay attention to people and pay attention to, to this, because I'm in something special. I know that. And I started to see how individuals will dive into the program and how blessed their lives become. And there's individuals that come into the program that didn't dive in. They were into shenanigans or faking the funk or whatever. And I'd see that they would stay stagnant in where they're at. And you're just like, oh shoot, like interesting. And so I, I, I you know, I have came in to, to get into the program, so that's what I did. Yeah. And then I just I just watched my life just open up. Like miracles after miracles of just things opening up. And um it was it's pretty amazing. So the people that I've worked with, if you want to call it that, um, just like in celebrities. Well, first off, Rich. Richard was, you know, he's a homie that's that's here. He's, and he is a celebrity now. And um, I had, you know, the honor to be able to see him kind of come through the program, uh, get, Central Casting would come to a home, or my, my homie Caesar would work through uh, Central Casting and get, you know, homies that, oh, we need a couple cholos. You know, like, yeah, sure, we sent a couple homies over there and get in the background and stuff like that. Um, and then Richard got involved in that. And then I believe that he got picked up on a series called Southland and he started taking acting really serious instead of from background to, to actor. Or, and, and, um, and then I never really followed it, you know? He was, everyone was telling me that he was in it and I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know? I don't really watch TV, so I'm not, and then one day um, we have counsel in this office where we have, you know, um, probably around 10 people that, that have their ears to the ground. We meet every day um, and give them what's going on right now. You know, snapshot on, on the trainees that we're, we're serving. Yeah. What do we need to pay attention to? What, you know, what's going on in the streets? You know, I mean, keep, you know, yeah. to keep order and understanding. And if we need to embrace people more, we embrace them more. So in that meeting, Father Greg was here and he goes, hey, did you guys see Richard last night on, on Southland? Amazing, Father Greg said. Yeah. And he goes, and I go, no, gee, I didn't see it. And I don't know how he recorded it, but he recorded it. And then he showed us on his phone. And, and there was this scene where Richard is, the cop kind of made him dig his own grave. And, and, and um, Richard is like, he's like saying, don't kill me, man, don't kill me. And a cop's like, and mad at him and he has his gun. And then Richard turns around and he's like, like he accepted he was gonna die. And then he just turned around and just said like, and he looks, he look, he's looking at the cop and, and he, he says whatever that he says and a tear comes down and you're just like, oh shoot, this dude is an actor. Like yeah. he pulled us into his scene and, and made me like, you know, if he made me sorry that he was gonna die, then he made me root for him because he was like, well, kill me then, you know? Yeah. And, and I was like, that's something, that's something special right there. And, and we were all amazed. And then from then on, he just, everybody grabbed for him and, and was pulling him in different, you know, different directions. And, and Rich is awesome, dude. He don't, he don't really brag about his stuff or anything. You just gotta see, go to the movies and you might catch him and, and you're like, dude, Rich is in this movie too? <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. And, um, and then he got into the Mayans and he got a, a few of us up to be a part of the Mayans, me included. And um, I'm a huge fan of Sons of Anarchy. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a motorcycle driver myself. And he asked me to be in the Mayans. And next thing you know, I got a, my chaleco and yeah. you know what I mean? I'm in there acting hard and I'm like, oh, this is cool, man. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm a fan of this show and now yeah. I'm on the show. And then there's Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey came in and uh, you know, he had saw the documentary G-Dog. So when he walked in, I was like walking toward him and 
and I didn't know what to say because I was kind of starstruck a little, you know? Yeah. And he goes, Hector! And I go, Jim! <laughs> and we started laughing and we gave him a big old hug and I'm like, what's up? You know, and we started talking and stuff and and we did a tour and he brought in uh, Transcendental Meditation into Homeboy Industries. He got like a hundred of us, maybe a hundred plus uh, into uh, meditation, which is really, really awesome. We did retreats, retreats yeah. Retreats, yeah. And um, amazing things. I didn't know that how amazing meditation is if you really take it serious and do the stuff. So um, yeah. there's a lot of really, really great people that come and they, they hear about Homeboy Industries and the love of Homeboy Industries and they want to experience it themselves. Any preacher that I've known don't don't I don't really know them. They're just a preacher, yeah. you know. Father Greg is a preacher that that kicks it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he don't leave when he's done. And then you get to really know a person and say, well, this is a man of God. He's a priest, you know, a Jesuit priest. Yeah. You know, and and then, but he's not. He's a friend. Yeah. He's a person, and he loves God, and he loves me, and he will talk, and 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 I trust him. And with my trust, I'll be able to open up. And and something that most most of us don't do is open up. So then when we open up, then, then we, we open up the floodgates of emotion. Yes. We're, we're vulnerable. And, and something that, again, that we mask with, you know, with aggression, with, with, with meanness, you know? But with him, you open up and you cry and he'll cry with you. He'll feel your pain. He'll be with you in that pain. And, and for me, that's like, that's so, Intimate is the word, I think. It's like, is this what a father should be? Most of us don't have fathers. And you know, you have someone who's positive, who loves you, who will put your arm around you, would cry with you, and you think like, this is probably what it's like, you know what I mean, to have a dad, you know? And um and and he's like that. He's he's loving, he's generous, you know, you know. I'm one of them that would say like, dude, people are just taking advantage. And he's like, no son, no one's taking advantage. I'm giving the advantage. Yeah. It's a love that I've never understood, that, that I've never known, you know, and and I'm trying to understand to this day. And 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 I sit in his seat, I have the honor of sitting in, in his seat. Yeah. And I say, hurry up, Hector, and learn. You need to learn now. You need, and, and I am, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to embrace love and generosity and, and it's not black and white it's in it's in the gray space and the gray space we call it the gray space and it's just like i and the staff here are being trained by a master and it's awesome yeah i think you know when i think about even me talking about it and i hear people talking about it and i wonder what does the public listen when they hear us talking about father greg i wonder what they think i know what i would thought if I didn't know, I would say, you guys are in a cult. You guys are tripping. That white man has got you by the brain. Yeah. I, I could judge whatever I see. And, and, but if you know, if you're here and you're, and you're, and you're open to learn and you're open for, for, you open your heart for love, if you allow it, then, then you say, no, no, no. That's, I understand what you're saying. And I can see what you, what you, what you mean by that. But this is, this is real, this is love. And there's no one making anybody do anything. Matter of fact, we, 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 we want to be here. We want to, to embrace, and, and this ripple effect of love that comes from this man, that comes from God, is, is, is coming into me and me passing it on to my brothers and sisters that are coming through this program and my family. You know how much of a better father I am to my kids? When I hear Father Greg talk about God, I should say, I would say, nah, man, God can punish me because I messed up right here. He would look at you and say, what God are you talking about? Whose God is that? That's not my God. My God's too busy being in love with you to be disappointed in you for anything. And you hear that over and over again. And you start to believe that. And if you believe that, that's the God that I want. And it starts to open up your mind to, to, to God's love and my life and the mercy that's been shown toward me. I've seen um, 
my friend Jose Navarro. Um, he should have been a gang member. He's a professor in um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He's, he's got his doctorate and he's just a badass. And, and so it kind of messed up my theory on on things, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, maybe he was just a lucky one, but because he, he was with us, like he was a little chia, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, was, he was in the neighborhood, but something clicked, you know, could have been a coach, I don't know, but something clicked. And he said, Chile, I'm not going this route. And his whole family's from the neighborhood. They go generations there. Yeah. And, and, and but he said, nope, I'm out. And he, and he chased it. Imagine, imagine the barrio's healed. What would we be doing? Yeah. Where would our energy go? You know, how would it stimulate the economy? How would it stimulate who we're voting for? You know, I have a lot of guys that, you know, I go to the projects and, you know, a lot of my older homies are not there no more. The, things have changed so much, but um, I still go and I, I still, I love my brothers, you know what I mean, from, from, the, from the PJs. And, uh, you know, I don't think, uh, most people couldn't go back to their neighborhood and see people that they know that they've known since kindergarten. I, I love that I get to do that, you know? And yeah. um, and give hugs and, and, and everyone likes to, you know, because they get to see me travel and stuff and they ask me questions about that. And I feel, I feel honored to be able to to say that, hey man, we're all capable of, of, yeah. of fun things, you know? I put a lot of stuff on Facebook when I, when I do traveling and stuff and I, Sometimes I question myself, what are you doing? You're bragging about boop, boop, boop. And, and I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, that's not what I'm trying to do. I want people to see, and I want people to come and ask me, how did you get to go to Ireland or Sweden or the Caribbean? And I want them to ask me so I could, so I could lace them up in my own way and say, dog, I am you. This is possible. You just have to believe that it's possible. And, um, and I'm, I'm on the board for uh, Legacy uh, Legacy LA, which serves uh, the projects and surrounding area. Years ago, when we did, I did um, a class on, on, on a book that, that really changed my life. It's called The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. And, uh, and this was many years ago. And some of those kids, they say, dude, they still come up to me. They're men and women now, but, and they, they, they say, the book because I said read it over and over again you know yeah, yeah. it's fun it's fun. it's like it feels good to be able to contribute in a in a positive way instead of me lacing somebody up getting ready for prison all the neighborhoods that surround where I grew up at enemies of the gang or whatever uh yeah they come here some of them come and they see me and they know what I used to do and, and then, you know, when they get to know me and see me, they, they, they thought I was faking the funk. They said, oh, I know what he's doing. This is a major, this could be a major benefit to my old, my old world. Yeah. Uh, the networking and everything. And, um, but no, I'm 100% right here. And my enemies, my so-called enemies are my friends. You know, they're, I'm, I'll be happy to to serve, you know, and some of the guys that I've even, you know, served were, um, you know, I mean, like, like, oh, we, we really did some things together. And I'd come up and, and shake their hands and look at them and, and be like, you remember? Of course I remember. And it's like, you know, and, and I could see like, like, we good? Yeah, man. Yesterday was yesterday, you know? And it's like, we're good. I'm glad you're here. You know, yeah. and um, and anything that I could do to help, I'd be honored to. I'm glad that there's a place where we can come to. Usually, we get the door slammed on us, and we get disrespected, and and so it, it, it makes us tougher to go back into the barrio and say, well, "Well, forget this. Then I'll just be this. At least I'm somebody here." And I watch people. I watch my family want to go back to prison because they ain't out here, and and there's somebody in there, yeah. and it's wrong, and, and you know for this place to be open for us specifically.
for us gang members and not Chicanos for for the for the soul brothers for the Asian brothers you know for our brown brothers our native brothers you know and sisters um, like this is what an honor to be a part of it and I didn't know I was gonna be in this position I didn't I just started kind of moving up in you know, to the director position where I'm at now. I just feel like what an honor to be a part of this great organization to help, um, to be a part of just saying, Gaiga, yeah, homie. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, you know me from back then? Yeah, man. Look at us now. This yeah. is better. You know, the grass is greener on this side. Um, you can take care of your family. Or you, you'll be honored. You'll be honored if you honor yourself, you know, by, by healing, by, by loving yourself. Yeah, all right, I was like $40,000 in child support debt. And one of the things that I learned in the book is to just to picture where you want to be. And, um, and so I pictured myself on an airplane, like crossing oceans. That $40,000 debt got taken care of. I got my passport. And Father Greg was just like, you're going to Sweden, you're going to Denmark, you're going to Ireland, you're going to, you know, into the islands and this and that. And I love to travel. I love to travel. I love getting on an airplane. I, I even love taking Dramamine because I get yeah. airsick, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, my dream would be to travel around the world, um, talk about Homeboy Industries, talk about my life, and uh, th that's where I, you know, hope I want to write a book. These are the, these are the, these are my long-term plans. Homeboy Industries. I'm looking. You know, we have our CEO Tom Bozo, who's very smart man. Um, really getting our organization in um, financially in tip-top shape, even though we get smacked around by um, recessions and all this stuff, you know, COVID. Yeah. Uh, but he has a hell of a team. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for like Paul Newman type branding, you know, for Homeboy Industries, where we can, you know, keep it, keep that money rolling in, and keep this organization above water. Yeah. And, um, and grow bigger. You know, like we are the largest gang intervention in the world. I think we're too small. I think we're way too small. I think that, you know, with with understanding um, complex trauma and and all the the brain and how it, you know, how um, the dynamics work when you when you're dealing with trauma. I feel like we need cutting edge people here with us to help people get. Uh, get brothers and sisters through PTSD and and all these you know like really deep traumatic experiences and help us get through it. I feel like we can we can change uh, we could change the world and not we yeah we're, we're gang members yeah. but I feel like the world needs homeboy industries the world needs love and the world needs healing. You know, as we can easily just tell just by looking at our TVs today with protests and, you know, COVID and the sky is falling type of syndrome happening right now, you know? Yeah. So I'm waiting, you know, Father Greg is, is world, you know, world known and all, but he still hasn't, I think that he needs to be mainstream. You know, and we need to get this message of love, this message of healing in our communities and not just Boyle Heights, you know, South Central. I mean, throughout the, the whole world. There's a lot of great people in this place. There's a lot of, I, I really, you know, one person that I really look up to is Shirley Torres. She's like the female Father Greg, you know, um, she's so smart and, and so articulate and and so she, she has such a loving heart, 
you know, I look at her and I'm like, damn. Like I, I she would she would be the one I, I would feel I should be sitting in a seat. Yeah. Because I want to be in Ireland or something. Yeah, you want to be traveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. Don't give up. Don't give up your worth. You, you, you're worth way more than than anything. And if you did give up, like if you were, what, what are you going to? You're going to, you know, you already know the end result. But, you know, look, there's there's somebody in our lives and we, we just look a little bit, just want to look. And God will put someone in our lives that will love you, that will, that will there's a light, you know, and, and, and light up the path and just take it one step at a time and watch where it takes you. I still go through stuff, you know, but now I have a, a, I have a new strength. I have a, mm, I have a rope, a mercy rope that God puts down and says, hey, I got you. Yeah. And I could let go if I want and I could go back. I don't want to, you know, and, and I am you. You know, so if you're going through some stuff, I'm telling you, like, you can make it. You know, like, just just look and watch what happens. Look for that rope, it'll come. 